Right. Well, uh, thanks very much. My name is Jason Twomley. Um, thanks very much to the organizers for allowing me to tell you about some of this work. Um, so I'll be talking about, uh, uh, as it says there, bulk fault tolerant quantum information processing with boundary addressability. And it has quite a lot of relevance with the, the last talk as well. So that's pretty handy. So I'm from uh, Macquarie University in Sydney. And uh, where's that? There we go. Um, it's, uh, so uh, it's in the city of Sydney. Uh, we do have kangaroos on campus. Uh, that, that beach is not actually on the campus, but it's actually uh, on a place on island. Um, lots of kangaroos on Kangaroo Island. Um, uh, unfortunately, it's not close to Sydney. OK. So what I'll be talking about, the plan, uh, is that uh, do we, uh, the question I'd, I've been asking myself for the last few years is do we need complete ad addressability uh, when we build our quantum devices? And obviously, uh, since I'm here, the answer is no. Um, but then the question is, is how can we form uh, a quantum error correction if we don't have complete addressability? Uh, and in more, more particular, how can we do fault tolerant uh, quantum error correction? Um, and if we don't have addressability, then we have to perhaps give up the idea of making addressable measurements uh, and classical feedback and correction. So we'll be talking a lot about coherent uh, recovery. Um, so, uh, and then we'll talk about error correction with coherent recovery. Uh, that relates to the last talk. And then how to make that fault tolerant. And then we'll try and, and motivate, uh, okay, it's a three-dimensional, but we can also give you a two-dimensional version. Uh, of a semi-global uh, architecture that uh, uses very little addressability, uh, which is fault tolerant uh, uh, and uh, uh, can uh, essentially do act as a quantum fault tolerant uh, transport, quantum wire, or uh, full full blown quantum computing. So this is just to motivate, uh, you know, as as we go to. Uh, very large devices, do we actually need to control every single thing in, in, in the actual device? And there's many different uh, ways of, 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 this was talked about on Monday, different types of architectures for quantum computing. Uh, the main one I'll talk about is, is the circuit-based model. But it'd be quite interesting to see if the ideas we present here can be generalized to the other types of architectures. And so do we need to uh, have, have control over each and every single qubit? And obviously the answer is no or else I wouldn't be here. And why that is technologically very handy is that as you go to fairly complicated designs, um, uh, the control technology you need to do to actually address and control each and every qubit can, can, will, will get very complicated uh, and consume a lot of real estate on, on the chip or whatever. Uh, and so any type of uh, uh, idea to reduce the level of control would be good. And what we're going to do is we're going to borrow a lot of ideas from cellular automata. And uh, this is known now in the literature in terms of quantum control as global quantum control. So this uh, topic of global quantum control started a long time ago, actually. Uh, so Seth Lloyd published in 1993. Uh, an idea for a universal quantum computer that was based on a, a spin chain, Heisenberg coupled spin chain. Uh, we only had three distinct species, A and B and C, and they were coupled in, in a 1D chain in this alternating pattern. And he showed how he essentially you could uh, essentially put in a quantum algorithm and program up that spin chain uh, to do whatever you liked. Then uh, a bit later, Simon Benjamin, who's in the audience, had a very nice scheme where again, you had an alternating spin chain, but this time there's only two species, A, B, A, B, A, B. And you fed in distinct types of patterns of qubits. One type of pattern, uh, data qubits, moved to the right under certain sequence of pulses. And these were global pulses on all of the either A or the B type spins. Uh, and other pulses, uh, and other types of patterns called a control pattern, which moved around uh, sort of independently of the, uh, the green data bits and uh, it could affect gates at certain times under other types that came in. So uh, the basic rules are is you're not allowed to uh, have uh, an individual addressing or read out of an individual qubits at will. You can have spatially structured arrays, as you can see here, A, B, C, A, B. Um, and, but you can address and, and read out uh, banks of identical qubits. 
Um, so it turns out there's essentially two types of schemes that have been discovered so far. One is this uh, uh, scheme here, for instance, that has uh, data, data patterns that move around and, and control units that move around that essentially localize these global pulses to produce local gates. Another one, uh, another ones that have been discovered is one uh, Robert Brausendorf and as well Joe Fitzsimons and myself uh, found uh, schemes that used essentially the finite, finite the length of the chain to produce gates. So there's not many experiments. Uh, mostly these are NMR quantum computing. Uh, here's some uh, results from an experiment done by Jonathan Jones and Joe Fitzsimons and others. Uh, three qubit experiment. Um, but there's plenty of ideas. This is uh, David Corey and uh, Ray Lef uh, Mike, Mike, Mos Mike Mosca. This is to amplify using quantum cellular automata, uh, a measurement result. Uh, here's a, a crystal of dipolar molecules uh, from Peter Zoller, where perhaps, although he doesn't look at this, one could also do uh, global control here. And here's a recent work by uh, Thomas O'Clarko and others on, on perhaps doing some quantum games of life. So, um, okay, so people have now built schemes which, going back to these, are cap uh, going back here, they're capable of doing full blown universal quantum computing, but how about uh, error correction? Um, so, we would like, for instance, uh, to, f to have at least uh, something, for instance, like a, a perfect tr quantum channel, which is fault tolerant, uh, or, or quantum computing, universal quantum computing, which is fault tolerant. And can it be done? Well, um, myself and Joe Fitzsimons presented at the last conference uh, several years ago here uh, a scheme which was a, a, a bit difficult. Uh, here we had a self-similar, self, this almost fractal-like structure of qubits, uh, different species, uh, and the actual threshold was very small. So it seems pretty hard. But if it was possible, if, if, if the thresholds were much higher, it would be much nicer. So what I'm going to do is uh, focus on this particular architecture. This is this uh, um, uh, scheme, again, where we have a, a, a sequence of linear array of qubits. Uh, uh, they're coupled, say, by Ising. And, and one applies these gr red and blue pulses. These are homogeneous pulses of either C, C phase, the red, or, or, or um, oh, sorry, uh, X, where yeah, That's right, C phase gate. And the blue are the Hadamard pulses on each individual qubit. So one can show um, that if, for instance, if you start with an X gate on that spin, uh, it moves to uh, X gate here and to Z gates on neighboring ones. And this whole pattern, this whole qubit pattern delocalizes over the whole spin chain. Uh, but if you repeat the pulses a number of times, then uh, this particular gate here uh, recoheres on the spatial opposite side of the chain. And, and indeed, if you have a look at, at if you repeat this, uh, this particular homogeneous pulse of Hadamard's and then C phase gates, uh, n plus one times, where n is the length, number of qubits in the chain, then the whole spatial array is mirrored. And this is independent of the initial state of, of, of the chain. So this is sometimes known as a mirror operation. And essentially, if you had a particular state on one chain initially, it would be perfectly transported to the other end of the chain at the end of this mirroring, irrespective of, of the state of all the other qubits in the chain. So that's pretty handy. And it also works for CV systems. So here's uh, some work we did. Here now the C phases now are replaced by uh, uh, this type of unitary. It's just the position of the two harmonic oscillators coupled to each other. Uh, and the, the Hadamards are just uh, half a rotation of the harmonic oscillators, a quarter of the rotation. And essentially, you have a three CV system uh, in some initial state, after this, after this mirroring, it, it's flipped. So the idea we had uh, was to take uh, this type of scheme where uh, you have n spins in a chain and to replace each spin by a, a plane. And so essentially this is a, a 3D version of this, this quantum wire. And each plane will uh, essentially undergo fault-tolerant quantum error correction. Uh, these global pulses are, are now uh, replaced by C phases, which act uh, down vertically here. Um, and Hadamards act on each plane individually. 
So it's not completely global, as, you, uh, as, as I've indicated here, um, maybe on the next slide. It's not completely global. Uh, we're going uh, to have addressability in this xy direction, so this is the xy direction, uh, but everything is uniform in the z direction. Uh, for later on, we'll need to be able to address each alternate plane, so we will have to keep this AV addressability in the, uh, in the different planes. Uh, each plane essentially holds one encoded qubit, corresponds to that spin in the uh, spin chain, uh, and the top and bottom uh, are flexible. So this goes back to, uh, I didn't mention it, uh, but in this scheme, uh, I mentioned here how these al alternative, alternate uh, Hadamard and C-phase pulses mirror everything. If you add to this particular scheme the ability to do non-Clifford gates at the end of this chain, then you can do universal quantum computing on this chain. So th that, that uh, uh, corresponds to being able to do non-Clifford gates on the boundaries, boundary planes here, the top and bottom planes. And uh, the nice thing about this is if we have an error, uh, an error in this global pulse, then uh, essentially uh, each, uh, essentially it won't lead to correlated errors in, in a single plane. Different planes will have errors. So the, our restriction now for this semi-global paradigm is that we're not going to allow us, ourselves, to do any uh, uh, measurement uh, or control inside the bulk interior planes of this device. Uh, and we have to recover uh, coherently from our errors using, uh, without measurement, essentially coher coherent recovery. And we call that unitary quantum error correction. So we're going to choose a code, a quantum error correction code, and, and that'll be the bacon Shore code. And eventually, we'll show you the, air, the, the thresholds that we found. Oh, oh here they are. Um, uh, so the, the, gate, uh, the gate threshold that we found is, is, is about 10 to the minus 5. And the preparation, so we do need to res reset qubits, uh, obviously, to, re to pull out the entropy. Uh, the preparation and, and the measurement, which we only have to do uh, at certain times, uh, is pretty high. So the actual refresh engines inside, inside this device have, can be pretty bad. And this holographic control, essentially, all we're doing, most of the control, essentially, is only at the top and bottom planes. So, so essentially, um, uh, talking about quantum error correction, we, we've heard a lot about this. We need to be able to prepare states. We need to be able to do gates. We need to measure. And what we're going to have, to, we're going to characterize the probability for, for errors both in the preparation, that is being able to build cold ancilla uh, to take away the entropy, uh, the actual gates, the entry gates that we have to do, and eventually the measurement. Uh, and we have to make sure that errors don't multiply. So of course, uh, this goes back to the previous talk. Uh, essentially, the, the idea is we're going to redundant, uh, redundant coding, and we're going to concatenate. And we're going to try and make sure everything is transversal as much as, much as possible. Uh, uh, and, and, and I guess we know that if, if we make everything fault tolerant, then eventually, if we get a physical error below a certain, we can, can scale up as much as we like. So the thresholds, however, depends on many things, the code, the design, and the error model. Many things. But uh, measurement is a real pain. And I found this uh, jigsaw, pretty big jigsaw here. Um, so uh, essentially, you can just figure out that if you just have a, a, a moderately sized, I guess, well, I suppose at the moment it's not. It's huge. Uh, 100 logical qubits, 9 qubit bacon Shore code then essentially you'll have about 10 to the 6 uh, physical qubits, and you'll be doing something like 10 to the 4 measurements at every error correction step. So uh, we want to try and avoid that. Uh, and of course, measurements even now, OK, the best measurements are in ion traps. Uh, but uh, measurements aren't perfect. And so trying to remove as much as possible the, the, the need to do measurements would be much technologically much better. OK, so, so some things uh, we're not going to assume. We're not going to assume that all these error rates are the same. Um, we can assume that uh, measurements take a long time. Um, and the unitary gates can be improved by dynamic coupling, as we've heard. Um, 
Okay. So this goes, uh, so now what we want to do is somehow to remove measurement from the error, error correction syndrome. So uh, we, saw, we saw this uh, it, this type of circuit a few times in the, in the last few days. Uh, where you, This is the three qubit bit flip circuit where you encode, you have an error, you decode, and you, you do the recovery. And then you hopefully try to reset and repeat. Unfortunately, uh, when, when you do the recovery, the, uh, the, the decode it. But of course, we've heard now that uh, one can measure the syndromes, add a few more qubits, uh, essentially uh, measure the syndromes, uh, and, and do the recovery. And this was nicely done in the last talk through uh, jump operators. Um, however, uh, essentially a unitary version of this would be this uh, three Toffee gates here. And uh, then you would have to reset these two ancillas here. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, the bacon shore code. And what's going to be very useful for us is something called a majority voting gate. And uh, the, the bacon shore code is, uh, uh, well, here's the, but essentially I'll show you this later uh, in a minute. But here's the three qubit code. Uh, and this is what our, bacon, uh, our majority voting uh, gadget would look like. And I'll explain this in a few seconds. Um, but essentially, coherent recovery is pretty essential for most of the, the current uh, experimental efforts. Uh, we'll hear about this later on this week. Trap ions, the NMR, and the superconducting uh, quantum error corrections all use coherent recovery. So what I'll talk about a little bit is this uh, majority voting gate, which essentially uh, repairs the uh, single, single qubit error in, in this encoded uh, state. And, and I'll step through this bit by bit just to show you how this works. Essentially, if you imagine that the first bit has flipped uh, and we have two uh, banks of three ancilla, so uh, here and here. Then the first gate, the first two gates here, this is just a control X. And this is a control X where the target is shifted to the right. So that's that one there. And you notice that this here, that this is a control X, that is also shifted but that reflips that back to zero. And that one is cyclic, it shifted to the right. So then you have uh, this uh, state. And then finally, we have this uh, uh, control X, but it's in the other direction. And so essentially, this is controlled off this middle uh, bank of three. And essentially, uh, you end up with this pattern. And then finally, you do this bitwise toffly to the top. And if you notice now, the bit bitwise toffly to the top will correct that guy to zero and correct that guy to one. And now you're back into a product state, and, and this is now being corrected. And now you'll have to refresh these guys. But the interesting thing here is that essentially, uh, OK, I'll leave that. OK, so we'll use a bacon shore code. We've seen that many times. These are the stabilizers. Uh, these are the logical operators. And, and we talked about this is subsystem code. There's uh, gauge degrees of freedom as well. Um, uh, the nice code is many of the operators that we need to do the mirroring and the uh, error correction are, are, are transversal. Um, the only one that's not transversal is this set half, which we won't actually need too much. Uh, and uh, only now and then, at the very end, we'll have to do measurements at the very highest concatenation level. So here is the actual... Um, uh, air correction routine uh, for the fault tolerant air correction at the kth concatenation level. So this is very similar to what I had before, and this is the one now adapted for the bacon shore code. Um, and what I'll do is I'll step through this step uh, bit by bit to show you how it works. Uh, essentially, it works by um, using uh, the bacon shore code and extracting the syndromes again into the bacon shore code, but process them. Process them processing them in, in, in a QR partition code, and then correcting them back into the Baker Shore code via the quantum repetition code. So essentially, we need a, here's the actual data, and we need some ancilla, um, which I'll show you in a minute how we prepare. And uh, essentially, this part of the, the, the scheme corrects for x errors, and this part of the scheme is, is the dual that corrects for z errors. And uh, so, OK, so the first box. Uh, okay. 
So um, what I'll do is I'll uh, just make a little cartoon here. This is the data. This is the ancilla. This is a k plus 1 concatenation. This is 9 at k. And this is just a, a copy of the last row to just show you what's happening. These are all in the big sure encoding, and this is in the QR encoding down here. So let's imagine that we start, and there's an error that happens to be here, the next error. And then the first part of this block uh, that we had in this majority voting type uh, correction scheme, uh, the first part is, is to uh, do this X copy and also rotated X copy down. So that gives you this into the uh, Bacon Shore and Scylla. Then what we do is we start, we move on to the first part of this. This is, uh, um, uh, this just copies, uh, uh, just control X's everything into the last column, which I've just separated out here for clarity. And the second part then converts it uh, down into a QR encoding. So this now, uh, you have a very large QR encoding, and uh, essentially we have that type of a code. This last does the p last part of that uh, majority voting. Essentially, does this control X now again in the, but a roto rotating backwards. So this becomes a, uh, this just moves down like that. And now finally, we do this bitwise uh, Toffley, which so so, which can work. This, these are now classical uh, this classical data essentially, and we just uh, go back and move up, and and flip the uh, columns in in the Bacon Shore code. And that produces an X for this particular set of syndromes. And that's now two X's there. It's just a gauge degree of freedom. So it's no longer an error. If we had started with two X's as an error, that's just a gauge degree of freedom. And you see what happens now when we copy this down using these, these, these two uh, parts here, the CX and the rotated CX. You get this pattern appearing in, in the ancilla. And then when you uh, control X, move that over. Oh. Oh, well, I've done it already. Uh, those cancel out. Two X's, they cancel out. And essentially, these are the, the codes that you have in the, uh, the QR uh, syndromes. And they do, and that's correct, because that's just a gauge freedom anyway. So that was the, the uh, fault tolerant unitary error recovery done uh, at any uh, concatenation level. So how do we get the fresh qubits? Because we need to withdraw entropy all the time. And so uh, this is our, our, our picture of how the whole thing works. We have to have uh, with scattered within the, uh, each plane, there are many, many uh, systems which can be reinitialized, perhaps not very well. Uh, that's your refrigerator. Uh, then we'll have uh, methods to purify them uh, and then send these coal and scylla over to uh, uh, our computational engine, and that can do Clifford, uh, Clifford Gates. And then, of course, it can send, them, send things off here to, to do uh, magic state preparation. And once we have cold magic states, uh, we can blown quantum, quantum information process. Now, if I don't want to do this, then just this alone is this fault-tolerant perfect transport channel. So one way of preparing cold uh, qubits is we'll have to have some physical systems that we'll be able to reinitialize. So for instance, if we have NVs, we can optically pump them to initialize their initial state. And it might not be very, very good initialization. But uh, as Ray Laflamme mentioned yesterday, you can use uh, um, a few rounds of algorithmic cooling to get extremely cold uh, initial states. Um, we can use this majority voting gate in a number of ways to prepare the ancilla. And so here's a preparing logical ancilla for the, the bacon shore and just physical uh, uh, ancilla for the QR codes. And so that essentially does this uh, perfect fault tolerant quantum transport. So to do the, uh, the magic state, we have to do non Clifford operations uh, on the boundary. And essentially, we'll do those at the highest level of concatenation. And we've heard this before, uh, both Monday and, and, and Tuesday. Essentially, uh, what we have to do, we, we do distillation. Um, we, we make uh, many fairly initially bad states, uh, and we uh, bootstrap them up to a, a, 
uh, a not so good logical uh, magic state. Um, and so essentially this is what we do is we take a, an inner state, we encode it into a, a larger version and once, once if these gates are good enough then uh, it's almost, it's, it's, it has to be with a certain fidelity of, of a magic state and then once we get it there we can just use distillation uh, once our gates are good enough to get to a magic state. And then when once we get to this magic state, uh, for instance here, this is uh, teleportation to, into the circuit to get a non-Clifford gate. And we only have to do this at the highest concatenation level, and we do it on the boundary, and this we do need measurement, but it's at the highest concatenation level. So when we go through and work out the, the thresholds, um, so we're going to work out the thresholds for preparation, that's uh, uh, initializing these uh, entropy uh, uh, reducing sites, um, re uh, uh, and measurement, and also the gates. Uh, we find, we work through all the different types of uh, uh, error mo uh, modules, and essentially this one has the highest error rate, and we count the number of malignant pairs. That's what was we did, and we find uh, for, for this type of value for the threshold, which is actually pretty commensurate with uh, what the code with measurement has, uh, and so our physical error rates for, for gates uh, and, uh, has to be lower than this threshold. Um, now, the uh, measurements at the highest concatenation level um, essentially can be very bad, but essentially this depends on uh, how good our preparation is. And so if we have very good gates, then our algorithm, uh, algorithmic cooling can work very well, and very few rounds can produce very cold ancilla, and so uh, our measurement uh, threshold can be very high. And so there, there's a bit of uh, degree of flexibility here. So for instance, if our physical uh, gate threshold, uh, physical gate error rate is much below this, uh, then we can get our preparation error up to 1% so that because, the, uh, and, and essentially our measurement error then can be very high. So what we've shown now is uh, we've gotten this type of 3D architecture. We have semi-global pulses, okay, global, global pulses in this direction, but addressing in the XY direction. Uh, the planes need to be AB addressable, and that's because, for instance, when I do a Hadamard on a plane, in the Bacon Shore code, it flipped, it, it corresponds to a rotation by 90 degrees. Uh, and also, if I do the C phase gate all at once, there is a possibility of having correlated errors across different planes. And so we do it in, in two parts. Um, um, now, if it is possible through a bit of work to push this into a 2D uh, uh, arrangement, but uh, for that to be true, we need to have non-nearest neighbor gates, which might not be so easy in various architectures. So essentially, that gives us a fault tolerance swap to move things around. So the whole idea was to see if we can reduce the number of controls that we needed to do various operations in this quantum computer. And so we estimate now uh, how many uh, gates and qubits we need to do, uh, say, for shore factorization with these number of uh, integers of these number of bits. Uh, and what we do is we compare, uh, these are the number of logical bits, and this is uh, the improvement that this particular architecture has uh, against uh, an addressable circuit, but that uses unitary recovery. Like, uh, and this is with an addressable circuit with traditional measurement recovery. And so there's s some savings, significant savings here. So this is eight times better, 86 times better, 2,000 times better, 4,000 times better. OK, so this is my last slide. Am I? So what I've shown here is a semi-global method where we have actually controls on the boundaries, measurements on the boundaries, uh, and we call that holographic. Um, everything in the bulk is, is essentially happening uh, essentially uh, globally. There is unitary recovery and, re and entropy dumping happening all the time within the bulk of this, this device got 2D and 3D designs, and the thresholds that we've gotten seem to be on par with measurement-based uh, uh, Baker-Shore. Um, so 
one thing is we could look at in the future, um, although it seems pretty difficult, can we devise new designs which are more global and, and find uh, fairly uh, re more decent uh, thresholds for them. So the, the design that Joe Fitzsimons and I found a few years ago had a very, very bad threshold. Um, but maybe one could perhaps look at other types of codes, planar codes, topological codes, and devise re coherent recovery schemes for them, and they might have much better thresholds. OK, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Jason. Uh, I trust there are questions. There's one over there. I'm trying to figure out where you, where you would prefer to use these gadgets rather than measurement. Because if you've got essentially two-dimensional addressability, then you can do two-dimensional codes, so planar codes, topological codes. So it seems that what you're doing is replacing every measurement with a multi-qubit gate. And it seems that you can, you therefore require a system where the errors on multi-qubit gate are very much less than measurement errors. Now, I'm a theorist, so I don't particularly know many experimental systems, but that seems to me counterintuitive. Can you perhaps say if what, which systems that's true, or okay, whether yeah. that's not necessarily sure. the case? Sure. Um, so the whole motivation behind this is, is as uh, Hadea was mentioning, I don't, know, I don't want to bring the, the measurement information back up to the classical world and then do a classical control back down onto the device. Um, that requires an awful lot of technology. If I have a large chip with many, many qubits, I have to then bring classical, I'd ha beside them I would have to have measurement devices buried everywhere and the, all that signal would have to come up to a, a classical computer out of the Dewar or out of the, out of the, the, the cavity array and be processed and then a whole bunch of control technologies going back down, uh, redoing the recovery. So that's what I'm trying to, to do away with, all that layer of, of technology. May I just comment on that too? Because especially for trapped lines, for other systems that are related to that, measurements are expensive. They take a long time and they slow you down by orders of magnitude and al also they introduce errors that are completely unwanted. So I think this is the, the right approach and I'm going to talk about that tomorrow a little bit in more detail. I think that is very much depending on the implementation. Uh, I just uh, wanted a, to, to clarify something. Uh, when you're doing your algorithmic cooling in, in the bulk, I mean, clearly uh, not everything in the bulk is unitary or... or no, no, that's right. right. So scattered throughout the bulk, there'll have to be these little coolers. So there's little nano diamonds scattered throughout the, the bulk, which I can optically reset. Uh, but we've shown that they don't have to be very set. Is there another question? If that is not the case, thanks again very much, Jason. And we come to the